All right, if you're just joining us, we are following breaking news this morning. The Supreme Court has just issued a major ruling on affirmative action. In a 6-3 decision, the justices rule that the consideration of race in college admissions is unconstitutional. Let's bring in Evan Kamenecker. He's a former dean and former constitutional law professor at the University of Michigan. Uh, and uh, let's also, uh, are we bringing in Ed? Is, not yet. All right, let's talk to Evan first. Uh, all right, so Evan, let me ask you, um, so we, if you're just following along with the special report, even before the special report, mm -hmm. we were having a discussion about this. Um, so help me understand something. Uh, if a university chooses to, for example, admit students that are legacies, in other words, they have parents or both parents who went to that university and also donate to that university. I'm specifically thinking about Harvard University, which some reports suggest 43% um, uh, of applicants um, uh, to Harvard admissions are white legacy students. 75% of those, according to the reports, would not have been admitted if their parents were not wealthy or donors or alumni to A the university. Applicants or, or they get, get in? Sorry? The, you said applicants. You mean applicants or the people that actually get in? 43% of Harvard admissions. admissions. People who get in. 43% of Harvard admissions are white legacy students. 75% of those would have been rejected uh, if their parents uh, were not wealthy or alumni to Harvard University. Um, could someone bring a case before the Supreme Court and say that is unconstitutional? Uh, no. And the reason is because the statutes or the Constitution don't speak to discrimination on grounds like that. They, the Constitution speaks to discrimination with respect to race, with respect to sex, color, religion, national origin. Um, but it would basically say that institutions could take into account legacy or money or things like that as long as they have a rational basis for doing so. Now, that doesn't mean it's a good idea. And increasingly, universities, particularly private universities, uh, have either reduced or stopped the practice of taking legacy into account. And to some extent, it is because they think that it has had a, a, a negative impact on racial diversity. Um, but that doesn't mean it is nonsensical to do. Uh, it's nice for a university to have people who feel comfortable there, who feel excited to be there. Um, and I suspect that universities, some universities at least, will continue to choose to do so. Can we talk a little bit about uh, the dissent? Um, mm. the, the counter argument. I, I know that um, Justice Sotomayor, when she was listening to the arguments, um, you know, she was questioning whether or not race. She was talking about the fact that race, in fact, does have an impact on your options if you grow up in this country. Other countries see what we're talking about this country. That, in fact, you know, African Americans kids often end up in schools where there are fewer resources, where perhaps some of the teachers aren't trained as much. And to ignore that um, is detrimental and, and is dishonest in a way. Can we talk about what the ultimate, what the dissent sort of um, played out or what the dissent had to say? Sure. Well, a couple of things. Um, I actually am quite intimately aware of the conditions in the Detroit public city schools, for mm. example. Um, recently was involved in a lawsuit there. Uh, that showed that the schools were essentially schools in name only. You had buildings that were falling apart, no air conditioning, no heating that worked, uh, vermin that had to be scurried out or cleaned up after in the morning. Mm. As you say, shortage of teachers, shortage of accredited teachers, no homework that could be given to the students because they don't have enough textbooks to go around and they had no access to laptops. So students do whatever work they can do in school and there's no homework that can be done. Now, obviously, uh, when you have lots of urban areas in our country that tend to be minority dominant, that mm -hmm. tend to have schools that are less well prepar preparing them less well for higher education, it's not a surprise that they don't have the same opportunity to show their accomplishments, to do well on test scores, mm -hmm. uh, to wow their students with great essays, to do all the kinds of things that normally you have to do to present yourself well on a, uh, in a college admissions application. But I'll say something more generally. One of the things that the Supreme Court majority focuses on is the negative impacts that it claims come from affirmative action. Basically talking about the idea that uh, for every minority student who gets in, or in your earlier question, for every legacy student, I guess, who gets in, uh, somebody's not admitted. And I think it's important to understand that 
many, many more people feel aggrieved by affirmative action programs than actually are. So there may be a university that, for example, because of affirmative action, let's say 500 additional students get in who might not have otherwise, but 30,000 applicants who were denied might all feel that they were left out because of affirmative action. I talked to my students about driving around a crowded parking lot and you keep going and going and all the spots are taken except one that's reserved for service vehicles. Hmm. And you think, dude, if that were not reserved, I'd be parked and I'd be shopping by now. Hmm. But there's a hundred cars circling and all a hundred drivers think they're the ones who are being disadvantaged hmm. because the one spot is reserved. Reality, only one of you are. Hmm. And, then, and that well, may also be. So I was going to say that reminds me of the previous case that came up. And I'm, it, you probably have a better memory than me, but it was a young woman that was at the center of it. I think probably funded by, by a same, the same group or a similar group. Um, but at, at the end of the day, her claim that she was detrimentally impacted by affirmative action was rejected because she really didn't have the grades. Yeah, and that's, that's something amazing. that we see, um, and and it'll be interesting to see. I, I don't cover education, but uh, but I know, for example, that the state of California has done away with affirmative action in the California uh, university school system. Um, and they've had that in place since 1996, or they have taken it away, um, done away with it since 1996. It'll be interesting to see what the results have been uh, in in the UC system. Uh, Professor, just stand by for a moment because I want to bring in uh, our senior White House uh, and political correspondent Ed O'Keefe who is joining us uh, from the White House. So Ed, uh, so sort of broadly speaking here, this latest decision by the Supreme Court uh, with its conservative uh, tilt uh, is again indicative of this sort of upending of decades of sort of established jurisprudence um, that's sort of redefining, I think in 2023 in the last couple of years, um, uh, our American life on a series of contentious issues like, for example, this one and before it, Roe versus Wade. Yeah. And as we mentioned a little while ago during the special report, I think it's important to remember that there were conservative justices 20 years ago foreseeing today. Sandra Day O'Connor at the time writing in a similar case that dealt with affirmative action in colleges saying there may come a day when this court ultimately determines, based on how society is going and yes, because of the balance of the court, that this uh, is no longer uh, going to be allowed, and that is essentially what they're doing today. And again, uh, it, it eliminates race as a factor alongside your scores and a handful of other things. But what the court says in its opinion is that it can be included amid mm -hmm. a mix of other things as if it were part of the interview process or an essay uh, that's submitted that talks about some challenge you overcame in your life. And so it's not going to be eliminated entirely. It's just not going to be able to be weighted as equally as other things and as explicitly because those that were pushing for this change have argued because of that process there were Asian American students especially who they believe suffered and were denied admission to Harvard and the University of North Carolina and other institutions because they were using such a system. And again it's important to point out California, the place that most Americans would consider the bluest, the mm -hmm. most liberal state of them all, rejected a referendum on 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 this issue uh you know a few years ago mm -hmm. and across that state they said it wasn't necessarily necessary and why wasn't it necessary well there's evidence that among hispanic asian um and, and black voters in that state that they don't necessarily support it at all the idea of race-based college admissions or the need for it because increasingly those students are able to get into university based on the merits, based on their scores, based on the fact that their families have gotten to a point economically and socially where they can get into college. That's not to say writ large that's the case, but you're starting to see the change in part because those minority communities that programs like this were once uh, intended to help are arguing increasingly, maybe not a majority of them, but enough of them is showing that the numbers are changing in such a way that perhaps, hey, maybe we don't need that anymore to help us because we can do it on the merits. Perhaps that's where the court is trying to steer the country. Uh, that's an abrupt change. Uh, it's not going to sit well with many Americans. But in our own polling, 53% of Americans support affirmative action broadly. 70% in a recent CBS News poll said they oppose the use of race-based college admissions. Um, and, you know, so in, in essence, society or er, the country is to some extent with the court. Again, that's affirmative action overall. 53% believe it should be continued. 47% abolished. But on the specific question 
of race-based college admissions. There you go. Uh, and this is the partisan breakdown. 75% of Americans think it should be, or Democrats should be continued. Notably, only 47% of independents and 30% of Republicans think affirmative action should be continued. If we have the next slide on race-based college admissions, it's 70% don't think it should be allowed, 30% think it should be. You break that down, partisan differences exist but aren't overly dramatic. Republicans are widely opposed, um, and they're joined in that view by more than half of Democrats and by three, and four, three out of four independents. Black Americans relatively more likely than white Americans to say colleges should be allowed to consider race, but still just split on it. College graduates are slightly likelier than people without college degrees to say so too. So, um, and then there's this important question, how much discrimination exists today? Notice the smaller numbers there as you go though. 48% of black people say there is a lot, 28% of Hispanics, quarter of Asians, 17% of white people. So, you know, Thinking on this is changing and maybe changing in ways that people may not realize. Um, Supreme Court doesn't take its cues from public opinion, uh, but certainly, as you said, Vlad, this is a change in the ideological makeup of the court. That change, the 6-3 majority that conservatives enjoy, thanks to the Trump administration, uh, certainly now being reflected in what has been for so long an explosive issue, race-based college admissions, how exactly affirmative action should be used to help advance people in the higher education. All right, uh, Ed, stand by because we want to bring in uh, CBS News Chief Washington correspondent Major Garrett for a little more analysis. Major is actually right in front of um, the Supreme Court. My question to you, Major, is does this stop at college admissions? Does, does this decision have implications beyond that in the workplace and perhaps beyond? So based on my initial reading, and I want to qualify that very specifically, my initial reading of this decision, it is not a broad constitutional argument against affirmative action outside of the college admissions process. There have been some who have been fearful that the car, car, court might go beyond the question presented about college admissions based on my initial reading, and it's a very long opinion, so it will take some more time, and I will absolutely defer to constitutional law experts on this question, but I don't, in my initial reading, see this as a decision that has any impact beyond college admissions. That is not to suggest, however, that impacting college admissions is a minor issue in this country. It is not. Colleges grapple with this question all the time. And what the court essentially said, Anne-Marie, is if you use race, then you are using race as a marker, as a marker to make a set of assumptions. And that set of assumptions benefits some and possibly harms others. And the way to solve that problem, the court majority said, is to eliminate it entirely. In the words of Chief Justice John Roberts, who wrote the decision, Eliminating racial discrimination means eliminating all of it. In this sphere, Judge Roberts and the majority of the court are saying, colleges, you can figure this out. There are other ways to get to this, but if you are using race in your consideration process, you by definition are assigning a set of assumptions to one question, race. And those assumptions help some, hurt others, and the way to solve that problem is to take that out of the equation entirely. So what could colleges do? They could look at zip codes. They could look at household income. They could look at legacy status. Look, if colleges, particularly elite universities, public or private, stopped giving preference to those whose parents had attended previously or were big donors, that would open up a lot of admission slots. Will colleges be willing to do that? That would be an enormous leap. It might be an enormous leap in the direction of diversity, but it would be outside of the question of race. And what the court is saying is there are ways to figure this out if you so desire. But picking up on Ed's point from a moment ago, he mentioned California. Right. The University of California system, after, by referendum, California voters decided to end race as a consideration in admissions at their most selective University of California schools, they saw admissions of black and Latino students drop by almost 50% overnight, virtually, within the first two years. And they have, through lots of means, tried to re-increase those numbers, get them back to where they were before race was taken out of the consideration process. They have not found a way to do that. So this is hard work, and it's the hard work now that colleges and universities across this country, with the result of this decision, are going to have to undertake. I'm really glad that you brought that up, Major, because I know in California they have implemented all these sort of outreach kind of programs to go into communities and encourage more applicants. But it's you know kind of when you get to the to the to the 
when you get to the point where you're applying for you know a place at a college that's the final step on this journey. I mean, before that, it's about you know proper uh, funding of schools. It's about uh, proper access. It's about all these other things that this decision doesn't really kind of address. Um, and, and, and if I could, if I could, Anne Marie, uh, Sonia Sotomayor speaks to this in her dissent. At yeah. one point, she says this decision by the majority creates a superficial. These are her words. I quote: "Superficial rule of color blindness." in an endemically segregated society. Justice Sotomayor, who, like Justice Thomas herself, both of them were products, they have said themselves, of affirmative action in their college admissions process. And though both benefited from it, both have diametrically opposed positions on what it means and what it meant to them. For Justice Clarence Thomas, he believed arriving at Harvard, I mean at Yale rather, forgive me, Yale, stigmatized him because he thought many of his fellow law students thought he was only there because of his race, not because of his underlying qualifications mm -hmm. and justifications academically to be at Yale. And that always, he said, burdened him in Yale and burdened him in his life after law school. Sonia Sotomayor looks at this more holistically and says, in our history, constitutionally and other laws, we have discriminated against people of color in this country. And that discrimination has kept them out of places like colleges and kept them out of places where you can generate generational wealth. And that history has to be taken into account when you think about the real world lived experience in our past and how to redress that in the future. Diametrically different yeah. positions on the same issue for two justices who both benefited from affirmative action. Yeah, though I don't know if Justice uh, Thomas would agree with you on, on that conclusion that he benefited from affirmative action, but certainly Sotomayor has said, look, I had lower scores, lower standardized scores than some of my other classmates, but I was capable. Well, I mean, Justice Thomas said, yes, I got into Yale not because I wasn't qualified, but because they had a program mm. by which they looked and sought after students of my kind. So he acknowledges that's how he, that was in part how he got into Yale. Mm. But what he says, the stigma that he carried with it then and for the rest of his career burned in him this sense that this is a, on its face, unfair application because it creates a notion, it creates a set of assumptions, which is one of the things the court gets at here. And in during oral arguments on these two cases, Justice Thomas kept asking, what's the definition of diversity? Can you give yes. me a definition of what that word means? Because yeah. I know what the Constitution means. I know what equal protection means. I know what race consciousness means. You define diversity for me. And because he did not, and the majority of the court did not receive to its satisfaction, a definition of diversity, what it means, what its value is, and why the state should go out of its way to allow it to continue, they said no. Because those are vague and imprecise, we we're going to go with the precise language of the 14th Amendment. They understood, to their minds, application of the 14th Amendment and the Equal Protection Clause. You're going to say you're going to treat everyone equally by taking this out of that equation. Yeah. Hmm. Uh, all right. Uh, major robust discussion there. Uh, stand by while we bring in CBS News congressional correspondent Nicole Killian, who's following this from Washington, D.C. for us. Uh, Nicole, what are you hearing? Well, we are seeing a lot of reaction from both sides of the aisle. Most notably, you have a lot of Democrats that are decrying this position. Just a short time ago, Majority Leader Chuck Schumer released a statement saying that this is a giant roadblock uh, and, of course, uh, blasting the decision, saying that this will impact the admissions process for the next cycle of students. You also have a Delaware Congresswoman Lisa Blunt Rochester, who's also running for a U.S. Senate, who said that she was at a loss for words, and that this decision by the Supreme Court to, in her words, a gut affirmative action is wrong, plain and simple. On the flip side of the aisle, you have many Republicans who are praising this decision, uh, calling it a welcome victory. Uh, for instance, you have a Congresswoman of Virginia Fox, who is on the House Committee for Education and Workforce, and uh, she calls this, again, a welcome victory for countless students across the country. Uh, other Republicans also weighing in, uh, praising this decision, as well as some 2024 candidates, from uh, former President Donald Trump to former Vice President Mike Pence, who has said there is no place for discrimination. Uh, you also have Vivek Ramaswamy, a Republican primary candidate, who says that he is glad that uh, the Supreme Court has laid to rest the worst failed experiment in American history. So, uh, right now, a lot of uh, this reaction seems to be uh, right 
right along party lines, uh, and we know this uh, will continue to be a politically charged debate as uh, folks continue to react to this decision. Indeed, Nicole, thank you so much. And we are going to continue to uh, get reaction and analysis of this decision. We're also waiting uh, for some more decisions coming down from the Supreme Court. Perhaps the next big one is the Supreme Court weighing in on President Biden's plan to uh, forgive student loans. Um, that's, you know, that is what he campaigned on. And so whether or not the court rules in his favor will be huge. We're going to take a break for now.